Welcome to the deep dive. Today, uh, we're going to be tackling something that, well, affects every single one of us. It really does. Quality control. Yeah. Um, you've given us a fascinating mix of materials on this Six Sigma article. Mm. Comparisons with PPM, percentage defects, even those. Oh, yeah. Tricky coop and crippy kick indices. Those are fun. You clearly want to go beyond the basics here, and I have a feeling our expert has some insights that'll make those aha lights go off. Well, hopefully, yeah, there's there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. Okay. It's not just about numbers, you know. Right. It's about the mindset behind achieving quality mm -hmm. and the, the real world impact yeah. those choices have. Exactly. So get ready to deep dive into the world of quality control. All right, let's do it. We're not just defining terms today. Okay. We're exploring when to use which tool and why that makes all the difference yeah. in industries from aerospace to, well, your last online shopping experience. Oh, absolutely. Because let's be honest. Yeah. We've all been there. Oh, yeah. Waiting for a package that arrives damaged oh. or, or frustrated with a product that just doesn't work as promised. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. But here's the thing. We often see claims like 99% effective uh, and good. think that's fantastic. Yeah. But is good enough, yeah. actually good enough, especially when you start thinking about things like right. cars or airplanes. That's where the nuance comes in. Okay. A 0.26% defect rate. Okay. Which might sound minuscule. Right. Translates to 2,600 faulty parts per million. Wow. Now, imagine that in car manufacturing, potentially thousands of vehicles with safety issues, mm -hmm. suddenly those decimals become a very big deal. Okay, yeah, now those percentages are giving me chills. Yeah. And I'm definitely not getting on a plane with that kind of defect rate. No, I hear you. This brings us to Six Sigma, this almost mythical quest for near perfection. Yeah. It's not just about aiming for a really high percentage, is it? There's a whole philosophy behind it. Absolutely. Yeah. Six Sigma is about a total transformation of how we approach quality. Okay. It's a methodology. Mm -hmm. A way of thinking that permeates the entire production process. Okay. We're talking about a defect rate of no more than 3.4 defects per million opportunities. Wow. That's the Six Sigma level. That's that's uh, a lot of nines after the decimal point. It is. That level of precision is, is mind-boggling. Yeah. What kind of resources and commitment does it take to achieve that? It's a significant investment. Mm -hmm. But companies like Boeing, for example. Right. Realized that the cost of poor quality was far greater. Oh, I see. Back in the early 90s. Yeah. They were facing serious challenges with their assembly line. Mm -hmm. It was outdated. Okay. Inefficient. And they were seeing the impact on their bottom line. So they turned to Six Sigma to revamp their whole system. Exactly. And that's where the DMA and IC cycle comes in. Uh -huh. It's the core of the Six Sigma methodology. Define, measure, analyze, improve, control. It sounds like a detective story. In a way, it is. Oh. You're defining the problem, gathering data, analyzing it to find the root cause. Right. Then implementing solutions and putting controls in place to ensure those improvements last. Okay. In Boeing's case, yeah. they used DMAIC to streamline their processes, eliminate waste, and ultimately improve both the speed and quality of production. So it's not just about aiming for a number. No. It's about systematically identifying and eliminating the root causes of defect. That's the key difference. Okay. This is giving me a much clearer picture of what Six Sigma actually means in practice. Good. Now, we've talked about percentages and this super high bar of Six Sigma, okay. but you also mentioned PPM, parts oh, yeah. per million. Yeah. Is that just another way of expressing the same thing? Not quite. Yeah. While percentages give you a broad overview. Right. PPM gets incredibly granular. Okay. It's about tracking tiny changes over time, mm -hmm. especially in high volume production. Uh -huh. Imagine you're a car manufacturer analyzing warranty claims for a specific part. Okay. I'm following. A tiny percentage of claims might not seem like much. Right. But when you're producing millions of cars, yeah. that could represent thousands of faulty parts. Oh, okay. PPM helps you zoom in and see patterns that percentages might miss. So it's like having a microscope for quality control. Exactly. Allowing you to see those subtle variations that can have a big impact down the line. Yeah. But wouldn't that level of detail be overwhelming for most people? That's true. Yeah. PPM can be a bit much for the average person to grasp. Right. And even for internal communication, mm -hmm. it's often more effective to pair PPM data with percentages okay. to provide context. That makes sense. Yeah. You need the big picture and the zoomed in view. Uh -huh. So we've covered Six Sigma, PPM, 
percentage defects, right. each providing a different level of detail. Each serving a specific purpose, depending on what you're trying to achieve. No, I have to admit, when I saw Cleep and Cleep on your reading list, I thought, yeah. what in the world are these? They oh, sell they like... do. Something out of a sci-fi movie? Yeah, they do. But I know you wouldn't have included them if they weren't important. Of course not. So break it down for us. What are these mysterious indices all about? Well, they're actually more straightforward than they sound. Okay. Clip and Creepy are all about process capability. Right. How well a process can consistently produce results within the desired limits. Okay. Capability. Yeah. So how capable does a process need to be? Yeah. Is there a gold standard? In an ideal world, you want a process that is both consistent and centered on the target. Okay. Creepy tells you about the consistency. Right. The potential variation in the process. Okay. The higher the creepy, the tighter the spread of results. So a high CP means things are running smoothly, uh -huh. like a well-oiled machine. Exactly. But there's a catch. Oh. Even a highly capable process can be off target. Okay. That's where creepy comes in oh. and measures how well the process is centered within the desired limits. Ah, uh, so it's like aiming an arrow? You can be a great archer consistently hitting the same spot, mm -hmm. but if your aim is off, you'll never hit the bullseye. That's a great analogy. Thanks. Keepy is your skill, your consistency. Right. Well, Keepy is your accuracy, how close you are to the target. Okay. And in many industries, being slightly off can have oh. significant consequences. For sure. Yeah. Okay. That makes so much sense. Now, can you give us a real world example of this? Sure. Something that brings KP and TP to life beyond archery. Let's go back to those airplane bolts we mentioned earlier. Okay. Yeah. Imagine a manufacturer producing bolts that need to be a specific length. Right. With very tight tolerances. Yeah. If their process has a high seep. Okay. It means they're consistently producing bolts of a very similar length. Okay, good. But what if those bolts are consistently slightly too short? Then you have a problem. You do. Even if they're all perfectly uniform. Precisely. Yeah. Their key peak would be low. Okay. Indicating that the process, while consistent, yes. is not centered correctly. Mm -hmm. This could lead to a situation where a batch of bolts is rejected. Right. Causing delays and potentially impacting safety. So understanding seep and creep, it can help manufacturers fine-tune their processes. Yeah. Ensuring that they're not just consistent, right. but also on target. That's the power of these indices. Okay. They provide valuable insights that can lead to real-world improvements. Ooh, okay, I have to say, this is starting to feel less like a foreign language. Good. Good. And more like a powerful toolkit. Right. We've gone from simple percentages to the rigor of Six Sigma, and now these process capability indices. You're coming together. It's like we're building a whole new understanding of how quality works. I like that. And the best part is yeah. these concepts aren't just for manufacturing giants or statisticians. Right. They can be applied in everyday life, too. Absolutely. Hey, really? I'm all ears. Think about choosing a new coffee maker. Okay. You might read online reviews and see that a certain model has a high percentage of positive reviews. Right. It's like looking at its overall quality score. Okay. But what if you dig deeper and find that many people complain about the carafe breaking easily? Ah, uh, so that reveals a potential weakness yeah. in the design or manufacturing process. It does. Like a hidden defect. Exactly. Okay. Or imagine you're hiring a dog walker. Okay. You might ask for references mm -hmm. and notice that previous clients consistently praise their reliability. Right. But mention that the walks are always shorter than promised. So high sif they're consistent, but yeah. low sif they're not meeting the target duration. Exactly. It's like the off-center bolts, but for dog walks. You got it. These concepts can be applied to so many situations, yeah. helping us make more informed decisions. This is really eye-opening. It's yeah. like you're saying that understanding quality control can actually make us smarter consumers. It can. And better decision makers in all areas of life. Absolutely. It's about being more aware, asking the right questions, and looking beyond the surface. Right. Because sometimes... A seemingly small difference in a percentage right, or a slight deviation from the target yeah. can have a significant impact on the outcome. This has been a fascinating deep dive so far. It has. We've gone from feeling intimidated by all these technical terms yeah. to actually seeing how they can empower us. That's what I like to hear. And I love how you've brought these concepts to life with relatable examples. Mm -hmm. From airplane bolts to dog walks. A it makes it all click into place. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Because... 
ultimately that's what this is all about demystifying these concepts yeah. and showing how they can be applied in meaningful ways it feels like we've uncovered a whole new way of looking at the world it is and i'm already catching myself thinking about clep and clap like when i'm online shopping that's the goal once you start to see these quality control principles you realize they're everywhere right and they can be surprisingly empowering Speaking of empowering, I remember that in the listeners' notes, they specifically mentioned an article yes. about how Six Sigma was applied in healthcare. Oh, interesting. That seems like a completely different world than manufacturing airplane parts. It is, but the principles remain the same. Okay. In healthcare, the focus might shift from physical defects to variations in treatment protocols or patient wait times. So instead of parts per million, right. you might be looking at patient outcomes or the time it takes to get a diagnosis. Exactly. Wow. The DMAIC cycle can be used to identify bottlenecks in a hospital's emergency room procedures or to standardize treatment protocols for a specific condition. It's amazing to see how these concepts can be adapted to such diverse fields. Yeah. And it makes me think about those articles the listener sent on the limitations of PPM. Right. What are some of the potential downsides to focusing solely on parts per million? Well, as we touched on earlier, PPM can be difficult to communicate to a non-expert audience. Right. It can also create a false sense of precision if not used carefully. What do you mean by that? Obsessing over tiny variations in PPM might lead to unnecessary adjustments or distract from addressing more systemic issues. So it's important to keep the bigger picture in mind. Yeah. PPM is a powerful tool when used appropriately. Right. But it's not a magic bullet. Exactly. It's just one piece of the quality control puzzle. Okay. As we wrap up this deep dive, okay. I want to touch on one more thing. Right. You mentioned that even in our daily lives, understanding these concepts can help us make better decisions. Yes. Can you give us one final takeaway, something our listener can apply right away? Here's something to consider. Next time you're evaluating a product or service, correct? ask yourself, what are the critical quality characteristics that matter most to me? Okay. Then look for information that speaks to those specific aspects. So instead of just being swayed by a general claim like 99.9% .9 effective, right. dig deeper and consider what that actually means in the context of what you're buying. Precisely. If you're buying a phone, battery life might be a critical quality characteristic. Right. If it's a car safety ratings would be paramount. Yeah, that's a good one. Understanding the specific metrics and how they relate to your needs can help you make a more informed choice. This has been such an insightful deep dive. It has been, yeah. We've explored the philosophy behind Six Sigma, mm -hmm. the power and limitations of PPM, the nuances of QPEEP and CLEEPPEEK. It's a lot. And even how these concepts can be applied in everyday life. Yeah, they really can. I have a feeling our listener is going to walk away from this with a whole new perspective on quality. I hope so. And maybe even a few aha moments. I think so too. So until next time, keep exploring. Keep exploring. Keep questioning. Keep questioning. And keep diving deep. And remember, quality is not just a goal. Right. It's a journey. See you on the next Deep Dive.